Let's get started. Uh, thank you everyone for joining our webinar today. Uh, today's topic is uh, solutions for short-staffed medical practices. And uh, that is clearly a big topic of discussion today. And so uh, without further ado, let's get started. Uh, this webinar is sponsored by Vocal, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about the tool later. Uh, so when we get started, let me introduce our panelists. Uh, we have Monica Henderson, who is the Administrative Director of Alabama Neurology and Sleep Medicine. Uh, Monica brings a lot of experience, both on the clinical side and also on the practice management side. And uh, we work with uh, ANSM for several years now and really seen the, see them as being a very forward-looking practice. When we're talking about tools, about technologies to improve efficiencies at medical practices, they've been ones that we've really turned to because they're always uh, ready to... Um, to be on the cutting edge of technology. So Monica has been a great resource for us as well. And, uh, and hence we are, we're happy to have her on this panel. Thanks Monica for joining. Thank you for having me. Um, also today we have Paul Cox, who is the founder and CEO of Magic Medical Solutions. Paul has extensive um, experience developing AI technologies and automation for Medtronic before he started Medic Magic Medical Solutions. And uh, he's also the developer of Vocal, and he can talk a little bit about, uh, about various tools and how they play into improving practice efficiencies and really addressing the big topic we're talking about today, which is staffing. So today's webinar, we'd like to keep it as a panel style discussion, and we really want your engagement and participation. So you can ask questions in the Q&A below. Uh, we will put all the participants on mute at this point but uh, we will address the uh, questions um, at, uh, at a time uh, after we've done with, uh, with the first part of the session. So, so we'll, uh, we'll go through all the questions as, uh, as they come. So let me just lay the scene here. Obviously, this is not a surprise uh, with, uh, with the shortages being a top issue today. Really what we find is, uh, uh, staffing shortages are expected to continue through, uh, through through 2022. There really isn't any end in sight. Uh, a lot of talk about the great resignation and how that's impacted practices, uh, not just practices, but everywhere around us. And and that has been uh, that's been really um, really impacting the uh, patient care aspect for practices. Uh, without. Um, it doesn't need to be said that anyone working uh, in this industry has had a very stressful time during the pandemic, and it continues to be even more, both from a financial perspective um, and also just taking care of patients' uh, perspective. Uh, you have a lot of burnout in employees because of repetitive work, which we'll talk a little bit about. Um, and anytime uh, you do have tools come in to help out, there's often significant training uh, requirements for these tools. And uh, so bringing in people, training them, having them quit uh, hasn't really been a very successful path forward for practices. And so really, uh, this, is, this has been the big challenge of the day. Uh, it's hard to find talent when you find that talent, sometimes they leave uh, in a short period of time. So, uh, and, and the numbers speak for themselves. Uh, in, in 2021, they said an astounding 18% of staff at medical practices quit. And uh, I don't know how they got this, but 30% are thinking of quitting. So that's, uh, that is quite significant. Uh, what, what we found more interesting is that the obvious people quit for pay. Uh, they move on to other jobs that, are, uh, that pay more, but 20% of those who quit, which is a large number, quit because of burnout. And really, this is where I think technology can really help is how do we address the burnout issue a little bit better than, than the way we have done it before. So, um, so on that note, um, I'm gonna stop my uh, screen sharing and actually turn it over to Monica and uh, to kind of lead this discussion about, uh, about how practices understand uh, burnout. And so Monica, we've spoken in the past and uh, uh, we've talked about how little practices understand what their front desk employees are actually doing. So when you looked at this, I know you spent a lot of time looking at this at ANSM, what did you learn? <clears throat> a lot more than you think you're gonna learn. Um, so we've got 
a front desk department. We've got kind of a, 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 a patient scheduling department and we've got another scheduling department. So we have a number of little areas and each each area does something different. But what we figured out is a lot of what we thought was correct, but more of it was incorrect. So as far as like figuring out their daily tasks, there were a lot of things that if you start to finish for that day, there's a lot of things that needed to be eliminated. There was a lot of things that needed to be transitioned. There was a lot of things that needed automation with even within our PM system or our EHR system. There would be little bitty things that you could do that would take a step or a process or change something. So just because you've been doing it the same way all this time or this is the way we've always done it is we've learned that in order for us to survive, we cannot look at it that way. You have to look at, okay, we've always done it this way, but why? And can we do it a different way that would help alleviate something for somebody and make it better? So we found a lot, um, a lot of phone calls um, in the scheduling department was a was a big deal. We knew how many we had coming in or we thought we did, but it was astronomical when you actually analyze that. Um, as far as the a number of patient uh, phone calls even to our nursing department and we tried to kind of figure out how to best handle that and try to eliminate voicemail messages and have somebody able to answer the phone you know immediately so you're not spending an hour later on um you know trying to actually retrieve all these messages that's an hour that you could have done your work so just kind of re sorting things out to make it make more sense for what we needed then because it's constantly changing everything we do every day is constantly changing if we don't change with it we'll never survive yeah you know the one thing i've noticed is a lot of times practices are looking for data for information that they need to to, to see how busy people really are and i know it's not really <laughs> readily available because um you know as as someone looking from the outside in, not find people wear multiple hats at the same time. So it's really hard to say, well, how much time do you spend on scheduling patients? How much time do you spend on checking people in and out? Is that it, it is because each, each department does it differently too at different practices. So at ours, our check-in people at the front desk, they also have insurance and deductible and co-payment responsibilities and all that, whereas other places don't actually handle it that way. So the numbers are going to vary depending on what all that practice does and depending on what all that department does from place to place. I don't think you could ever really get accurate, accurate information. Correct. Oh, oh absolutely. Um, and that's actually one of the challenges when you do look at bringing in solutions when the pro when the problem sometimes is murky in itself. You, you know, you say, okay, so you've got all these staff that are working on these issues, but we don't know which particular issues need to be solved first because initially no one knows. And uh, it's it's funny when we talk about this is um, at some level, practice administrators and even physicians sometimes just assume that things just happen. And they're not really getting down to the level of, well, who's actually doing the work and how is it being done? One thing we did was I had each employee send me an email. And one question was, what are the top three things that take up the most of your time on a daily basis? Not saying that it can be changed because it might not be able to be changed, but what are the top three things? And then what are the top three things that you see as barriers or difficulties in your day every day to see if those things could be changed with the computer system or how we our phone tree does or whatever you know so um and that actually brought a lot of insight because there's things that you have no idea how much time somebody's spending on it until you ask yeah yeah and, and i think after a lot of this looking at what people are doing i know you've put in a lot more work than many of the other practices that we've worked with in the past and i noticed you came up with a tech stack and i want to share this because it, this i thought was um uh was quite telling um, so, Thanks. yeah. So, so when we look at for appointment scheduling and intake, uh, it wasn't one tool, but it was a combination of tools. Can you just walk us through um, how this is set up? 
Sure. So Follow My Health is really our um, patient portal. Um, you know, now your uh, most practices are following through because it's going to be a requirement to make sure you have a patient portal accessible for patients. So Follow My Health, we primarily use that for more of our um, patient portal uh, information for patients as far as they can go there and ask questions. Those messages and stuff actually come directly into their EHR chart. So that's more of a like, um, I guess you would say, patient to nurse or patient to staff connection, but you can't, you can relay information back and forth, but it doesn't actually, for appointments and stuff, it doesn't actually do any kind of scheduling. You can, you know, notify a patient about something, um, or they can go there and see their stuff, but in an but it doesn't do anything to take off of our, what I call our uh, critical staff as far as the front desk, the schedulers or whatever. So we that we use that one for that. Um, <clears throat> Vocal is one of our more recent ones. Um, I'm almost, I'll come right back to it. Vital Interactions, we use it for our appointment reminders that goes to emails and text messages. Um, so they remind the patients you've got an appointment you know, this day and this time. Um, and it actually does talk uh, directly to PM, to all scripts PM. Um, so if um, it needs to, if a patient cancels on that reminder, cause you can, you can actually um, indicate, you know, actions when you get those initial reminders sometimes from that. And then it also will allow you to send out um, mass messages to your patients. So let's say that we're gonna have to be closed tomorrow because of weather, or we're gonna have to close early today because we have no power or, or something like that. You can go in there and you can send out messages, mass messages. Um, for instance, when with COVID and everything, we've used it more than we ever have as far as if we um, started doing a lot of telehealth instead of the patients having to be in office. So we could send a mass message out out in vital interactions per provider or um, per day of the week or per, you can pick whatever time period you want. And you can say, this is an option. If you would like to um, have this as an option or change your appointment, contact the office. So that one's kind of a uh, directly messaging the patient with appointment information. And then um, Freesia <clears throat> does have some messaging options, but it is, we thought about changing to that, but Freesia's messaging options were not appropriate for us. It allows you to do some, but it does not allow us the flexibility that Vital Interactions did. So for us, we felt like Vital Interactions was better. So all we utilize the Freesia for is for patient check-in. So they check in on the Freesia tablets when they get here, but we also can send a, a text message with Freesia to the patient and email them also that says it's time to check in for your appointment and they can pre-check in with Freesia. So when they walk up to the front desk, there's no tablets, there's no, here you got to update this, it's time to re-sign this. Freesia check-in will take you through all the steps for their appointment type. Um, and then the Vocal is our most, um, I say most recent, we've had it for a while, but our, our newest addition, um, which is, an, it, it actually integrates into our phone tree and, and there's different ways it can do it. But anyways, you call our office, you press options and, and then you go to Vocal and there's an automated attendant, her name's Amy, and she can either um, confirm your appointment for you, you know, identify the date and time and everything. She can cancel it or she can actually reschedule your appointment for you. Um, and therefore you don't actually have to talk to anybody and it does directly link with all scripts PM. So at, instantly when an appointment is canceled or rescheduled or confirmed, it is live in PM at that time. So basically that has took a extreme load off of our schedulers. Um, <clears throat> there are, we figured out the phone calls every day, like the amount that was just to confirm it. Because not everybody does get text messages or emails from the vital interaction reminders. Mm. And so a lot of our patients um, are older and we have a lot of rural areas that they don't have cell phone service. They don't have internet service. Um, so we were having more than we thought of people literally just calling to say, when is my appointment date and time? Mm. And um, even though they may still 
get the reminder later on. So anyways, Vocal will do that and confirm it, change it, reschedule it. And there are so many people, that's basically what, you know, almost 100 percent, you know, all the scheduling calls every day boil down to those three actions. Mm. And so um, anyway, she's able, Amy or Vocal is able to take that off. So it's really our um, scheduling uh, employees have felt a huge burden off of them because they also are our checkout people here. So when our patients check out, they have to make their next appointment, schedule their testing or whatever. And they actually have more time now with their patients before it was um, not that they were hurrying up the patient, but I'm sure in their mind, they were wanting to hurry up the checkout process because their phone had already rang you know, 10 times while they were sitting with that one patient. So that was going to be 10 voicemails to get off the phone when they were done. So anyways, that's what Vocal does for us. Yeah. Oh, no, I really appreciate that. Um, I was also uh, really um, interested when I, when we first started working together that you kept having multiple options here. What was your thought to um, having more than one tool uh, and obviously everyone's, I know um, as, a, as a solution provider, everyone wants to tell you that this is a, one tool solves all the issues. But I think as a practice, you've seen that a combination of two works better. Why, why is that in your case? I guess I touched on a little bit of it a minute ago. One, you know, like I said, is our patient population. Right. Um, two is the accessibility to getting this other information. Um, and we have found that we had multiple areas that needed some type of automation or some type of process to ease the burden in those departments. So partially, we've chosen different ones because we needed something out of it that was huge to that department of our office one. Um, and again, it's kind of like I said earlier, yes, Freesia <clears throat> does have an appointment reminder um, option, but it does not do what we wanted it to do. Mm -hmm. And, and so it was like, we just figured out certain pieces of each thing didn't, solve all of our areas of concern. Got it. Uh, that certainly does make sense. And so when you did do all this, what kind of impact has it had on your practice? Um, <clears throat> I don't know that we would have all the employees we have still here <laughs> if we hadn't have implemented all of them. Um, no, it has hugely impacted us, especially the front desk. Um, you know, we our front desk is, I'm just using one example of like the being able to pre-check in. Um, that's been huge because of, we see, sir, I say off the semi, our, one of our busiest days, we're going to average about 180 to 215 appointments in a day at our practice. And we have two girls at the front desk. Well, you can do the math on the number of hours and those number of patients, and you can see how overwhelming that would be. And that's not including just people that walk in for other reasons, you know. Um, the the vocal example with our phone calls, we see new patients here every day. So we have our existing patients, but we see we have new patients here every day. So <clears throat> every day we're adding to our patient population. So it means that these things that we're doing in each one of these departments with this is just going to grow. Well, unfortunately, as you talked earlier on, as far as employee retention and being able to um, hire people, the whole increasing of pay now, well, if you're going to have to pay more to keep your employees or pay more to get one, then how are you going to keep adding employees? Eventually, you're going to run out of money. <laughs> and so if we didn't do this, I, I mean, there's no way we could we could continue to grow as a practice. And there's no way we could keep doing what we're doing, especially because healthcare every day gives us a new obstacle, whether it's you know, prior authorizations for testing, if it's, you know, insurance reimbursement, it's documentation stuff. Every day there's something new that an employee has to do. So if you can't get a process or processes to alleviate that, you just can't, you're never going to be able to achieve what you're achieving for that day. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, let me, thanks so much for that insight because it has 
obviously made a big impact on your practice to have a variety of tools. Uh, let me just turn it over to Paul. And Paul, from your angle, you know, given all these tools that are available for practices, which, how does a practice decide specifically which tools to pick from? Which yeah, so, to yeah, so yeah, that, that's kind of a, a complicated question with, um, you know, there's so much information out there with social media and it's, and people in, in clinics obviously do not have the time to be, you know, looking at a lot of magazines or online and researching. So it's uh, difficult trying to, you know, just find information and, and really evaluate the tools. So I guess you know, one of the best places to start is just looking um, like the forums, like all scripts has a really good online forum for all the users and just ask uh, out there. And from uh, what Monica's told me, that forum has been very helpful for her and people are very willing and open, uh, you know, to provide information and their experience with various tools. Um, but then once you start kind of getting a set of the tools that may solve your problem, you start having to, I guess, evaluate that, you know, what is the best for you, uh, managing the cost, pa patient satisfaction, what's going to improve your workflow. Uh, you know, you, you don't want a solution that's going to cost a hundred thousand uh, dollars. if it's only going to save, you know, a, a couple of hours a month. And, and so you need to evaluate all that. And again, the, the patient satisfaction is a huge part of that. Because uh, if the patients are not satisfied with it, and when also for, for the employees, uh, you don't want your staff to be upset. It, it makes their job harder, even though it may you know solve one problem, it may create another problem. So really trying to optimize that and look at the complete workflow. Uh, is it saving money? You know, what's the upfront cost? Is everybody happy using it? Um, those are the factors you really need to evaluate. Yeah. There's been a lot of talk now about automation. I know this is an area of expertise for you um, with, your, with your massive experience in the space. Um, and we all have first-hand experiences of um, you know, talking to robots uh, you know, on the phone or those annoying, you, know, you just want to talk to a live person uh, or you're just trying to get something done, but the automation doesn't exactly get you to where you uh, need to be. So what are your thoughts on which tasks should you automate and which tasks should you not uh, from a practice perspective? Yeah, and, and uh, Monica had touched on on this a little bit, and I'll uh, add to it. But you know, I mean, the, the one of the big things, I guess, a good, good a good place to start is to ask the employees. And what Monica did in their office, you know, a lot of people don't really you know talk with the people in the trenches, you know, doing the day to work, day work, you know, the people at the front, uh, uh, at the front desk, or you know, back in the scheduling department or billing department. You know, those are the people that really know what the problems are. So, you know, talking with those people on a regular basis and finding out, you know, their input, uh, they have firsthand knowledge of what the problems are and, and may have solutions to it. Uh, so that's really the, probably one of the best places to, to start and finding out what the problems are and, 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 you know, where to focus in on the automation. But also when you're doing that, you have to, once you start kind of narrowing in on what the, the problems are and, you know, what's the biggest impact on your uh, practice, is really trying to make sure that when you find a solution that it's not going to impact something else. You know, you may have a, uh, a billing solution uh, but it, for automation, but it's going to require someone else to do some additional work to verify it. So you have to think about the entire workflow. And just because you have, you know, one solution for automation that can help you in one area, you have to think about the whole workflow and not only the workflow, but how it's going to impact both the patient and the employees. Because uh, you, you don't want to have a new solution and where the, the patients aren't going to be happy with it. Uh, you know, keeping the pa patients happy and engaged, uh, you know, is a prime concern. And, you know, if they aren't happy, you know, they'll go to another practice. Right, exactly. And it, this really also comes down to dollars and cents as well. And I do know that it, it takes um, some investment uh, to bring in new tools into a practice. Right. So, uh, so as a solution provider, how do you look at the ROI for a practice, return on investment? How do they decide whether something's going to be worth it or not? Yeah. So, uh, you know, the, the, there, there are a number of ways. I mean, I guess, you know, the, the, the first is, I mean, if it's implemented, uh, you know, asking the patients and the employees if they're, if they're happy with it and talking with other practices that are using it. You know, find out if they're happy with it. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, the other is looking at, you know, specific metrics. Uh, you know, is it going to be a true cost savings? Uh, you know, how many real dollars is it going to save? You know, how many real hours is it going to save your staff to do it? 
Uh, you know, the, the, there are some uh, metrics you can use um, when you're bringing on a new tool or think about bringing on a new, new tool. Um, it, it's a good idea to ask if they have a, uh, uh, a free trial. Uh, you know, you don't want to spend thousands of dollars and, you know, spend months implementing it and then figure out, you know, you're stuck, you know, using it for three years and then, you know, you can't get rid of it. Uh, so, you know, if a company has a free trial for a product, uh, then by all means, you don't know, take it. Uh, and also another aspect of it is the time to implement it. Uh, you know, so some uh, solutions out there, they may be, you know, really good solutions, but it may take four months to really implement it and, you know, weeks of your staff's time. Uh, so, you know, looking at factors like that can, you know, help drive a solution. Uh, you know, not, not all are, are created equal. And like what Monica did in her, in her, her office, you know, having multiple products, you know, that address different problems and, and, you know, each one has their good points and, you know, finding those products that had their good points and, you know, that work together, you know, that's a good way to really find the optimal solution for, for our practice. All right. So given all this that you have learned, uh, why did you develop Vocal? Well, <laughs> well I, I had worked at uh, Medtronic uh, uh, Medical Devices before I started Vocal. And uh, I was involved in the surgical technologies and we were doing uh, a lot of work with voice in the operating room. Um, and then uh, I saw the power of uh, voice and uh, Amazon was just coming out with Alexa then and Apple had Siri and the, the tools were really getting uh, a lot better and, and very robust. Um, and then kind of in parallel to that, I was talking to a lot of uh, physicians and spending a lot of time in hospitals and clinics and getting and just talking with people and seeing how they operate. And I just saw a real opportunity that, you know, there's so many challenges in the, um, in the clinics and hospitals where they're just, you know, there's so much paperwork and, you know, it, everything is just so time consuming. And a lot of time there's so much repetitive work uh, that people don't enjoy doing. Um, and I just saw a, a, a unique opportunity to use this technology that could really, um, you know, reduce and, and maybe even eliminate a lot of these tasks that would just make the workload and the workflow a lot better for practices. Oh, great. So uh, on that note, let's uh, do a quick demo of, uh, of Vocal, and I'm going to share this. So um, we'll call this a tool that uh, integrates into the practice management uh, solution. Uh, it's, an, uh, it's an all scripts uh, certified application <laughs> and, uh, and the way it works and you'll actually get to see it work real time is patients call your existing number. It's no new number, the same number you have and are directed uh, through a phone tree to our virtual assistant named Amy. And so Amy takes on the calls and specifically handles the routine mundane aspects of, uh, of scheduling, which are um, rescheduling appointments, canceling appointments or confirming appointments. And uh, this, uh, this is done in as, uh, in as seamless way as possible. And you know, to, to what Paul was talking about, there's been a lot of advances that have made in voice technology and uh, most of you are familiar with um, Alexa and Siri, and uh, that's the same type of technology that's used uh, for Amy uh, to be able to converse with patients. So as technology grows, this becomes an even more seamless experience. So I'm going to share with you what, um, what um, Amy sounds like, and this is me calling into live clinic environment uh, and uh, looking to reschedule my appointment. Welcome to appointment scheduling. I'm here to help you manage your existing appointments. First, I will need to ask you for some information. Can you give me your telephone number, starting with your area code? Yes, it's 205-555-0122. Now I need to confirm who you are. To help me understand you, can you tell me your date of birth like this? March 12, 1980? March 2nd, 1990. Thanks for your help, John. Please stay on the line while I take a moment to get your information. I can help you find, reschedule, or cancel an existing appointment. What would you like to do? I'd like to reschedule my appointment. 
Please stay on the line while I take a moment to get your information. I have found two appointments for you in the calendar. The first appointment is with Dr. Manning on May 7th at 9 a.m. The second is with Dr. Manning on September 1st at 9 a.m. Which one would you like to reschedule? The first, please. Just to confirm, you want to reschedule your appointment with Dr. Manning on May 7th at 9 a.m. Is that right? Yes, it is. Please stay on the line while I search for appointment openings. Okay. Let's find a different time for you. The next available opening is May 10th at 9 a.m. Would you like to take this appointment? No, that's not going to work. Okay, then. I also have a couple of other openings I can offer. The first is on May 10th at 1 p.m. The second is on May 11th at 9 a.m. Would you prefer the first or second option? I'll take the first. All right. Just to confirm, you would like to book an appointment with Dr. Manning on May 10th at 1 p.m. Is that right? Yes, it is. Okay. I have scheduled your appointment with Dr. Manning. Can I help you with any other appointment tasks? No, thank you. Thanks for calling and see you on May 10th at 1 o'clock. Great. So each of these calls uh, in real time take about five to seven minutes is what we learned. And so um, to, uh, you know, practices have often hundreds of such calls during the day. So it's clearly a time savings when it comes to your staffing. So these are calls that don't have to go to a live staff member that are completely handled uh, by Amy. And so that's that's been initially uh, what drove this. But you know, even beyond that, I think when it comes to real numbers, we found that uh, it frees, frees approximately one full-time uh, equivalent employee for every eight provider practice. It's a rule of thumb, really depends on the number of calls coming into practice. But um, we've seen many practices that, are, that have seen far greater uh, savings than this, typically one hour to two hours out of an eight-hour day for a scheduler. Um, and, you know, the benefits of, of adding this technology are, you know, obviously from a patient satisfaction perspective, they can call and reschedule appointments anytime. They don't have to wait for the uh, clinic to be open for them to make that change 24-7, Saturday evening, Sunday morning, whenever um, is convenient for them. And what we found is because it's so convenient for them, they can call to cancel appointments, uh, allowing that slot to be used for someone else. And this this really, the ability to um, for the clinic to uh, fill those slots, um, we found saves over $50,000 a day. And we've seen this across, uh, across practices. Uh, that is not a very conservative number uh, because practices lose a lot when, when providers are sitting around uh, for patients who didn't show up. And uh, really, you know, our goal um, with, with this technology was always to create something that's very highly uh, patient-focused uh, and, and to address some of the challenges with automation, not make it very robotic, uh, but to make it conversational. And, you, you know, one of the things that we've heard again and again is this uh, Monday morning blues of, of listening to the voicemails that came in over the weekend and then having to play phone tag with the patients. That's gone with vocal. So, so in real terms, that has made a big, um, big impact. Um, and uh, just uh, just so you're aware, we've uh, Vocal is 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 ninety nine dollars per month per provider. The pricing is very transparent. Just the number of providers that are scheduled. Uh, we do have enterprise um, plans for much larger practices, um, over twenty five providers, uh, and there's a one um, one time four hundred fifty dollar setup fee that applies to regardless of how many providers you have. Um, and uh, to Paul's point, uh, we do believe that, uh, that you as a, a practice manager should be able to test out solutions. And so we do offer a vocal at no charge to you. That covers the installation portion of vocal, um, as well as the uh, monthly dues to all your providers for three months at no charge. And, uh, you know, we give you the option to cancel anytime uh, during this trial period, uh, because this is really about finding the right fit for your practice. And, uh, and, and if you have any questions that we would love to chat with you a little bit more about this also to see um, how vocal and if vocal would be the right fit for you, please, uh, please shoot me an uh, email directly. Uh, my email is over there and, uh, and we'd love to hear from you. So on that note, what I'll do is I know we have a few questions over um, 
over the Q and A. Uh, so, so the first question here is, um, what is the onboarding process like with roll call? Does it require a great deal of time uh, of the team to put into place? And uh, in, in, you know, this is actually why we why we had um, developed roll call is to actually um, prevent uh, or, or prevent the requirement of a lot of um, onboarding. We realize that intuitive tools make a huge difference. Really, there isn't much of onboarding from a scheduling perspective. Uh, it is very um, transparent. Uh, the calls that don't go to the schedulers get handled by Google Call. Uh, what we um, what we have done is for practices where we've we've had Google Call installed, we've given pamphlets that they can actually communicate with their patients, saying, "Hey, by the way, um, here's another tool that you can have. you can actually call 24/7." Uh, to reschedule, cancel, confirm your appointment. So it's more patient education part that we've done. But from a um, true practice uh, perspective, there really has been um, hardly any um, hardly any onboarding. Monica, would you agree with that? Mm, I would agree with it. I was going to actually say earlier, like for administrators, if you got multiple tools like here, I actually have a, an individual employee that is kind of like our follow my health guru. And then I've got one that's kind of like our freesia guru because you you can't know everything about them. Well, with Vocal, really, you don't, I mean, you, at the beginning, <clears throat> you're going to make sure it's doing what you want it to do. And there's some choices because you can choose if you want it to do for you know, different providers, like you were talking about earlier. So here at the very beginning, it was us just deciding what all we wanted it to, how many people and providers wanted it to be used and that kind of thing and getting it into our phone tree. Um, that's it. After that, there's nothing else to do. Um, so and just getting it initially into your practice and there's, you don't have to do anything from that point forward. Um, just like with the other things we use here, we're not that we have to do anything with it, but we do constantly have to go in, utilize it, make changes, try to find something different that it we wanted it to do or whatever. I mean, Vocal just does what it, it does what it does. And after it's, after it's there, there's nothing to do. There's right. nothing you got to put your time into. Yeah, that's great. Hey, Joan Brown uh, asked a question we love answering, which is how does the elderly handle this? And uh, in fact, when we were developing Vocal, this was, this was one of the challenges, actually one of our founders, um, had their 85-year-old uh, grandmother call into, um, into Amy just to reschedule their appointment. And, uh, and uh, she was very um, happy. She was able to successfully navigate and successfully able to change her appointment using Google Call. Uh, that clearly is a, a big part of um, how um, AI technologies or voice technologies have um, changed over time. Paul, am I missing anything there in terms of the voice uh, where it is today? Oh, you're on mute. No, I, I think you did a good job. Uh, but yeah, we, we spent a lot of time and effort uh, to specifically address that. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I've been involved in voice uh, uh, quite a bit. And uh, when I was with Medtronic, we were operating in a surgical environment, which was very stressful. Uh, so. I knew the, the challenges of just dealing with you know, different kinds of people, dealing with different accents, uh, different age groups. Uh, so we spent a lot of time to make sure that Amy can handle that. And, and it will transfer out. So if a patient's struggling with it, it, it doesn't like make them sit there and continue to struggle. It will transfer out if, if Amy's not getting the right information or she can't understand you. And so it'll transfer out to a live like to the actual extension that it, that it needs to go to or to a live person. Now they may not be able to answer it. So it may go to their voicemail, but it won't just leave you in this big circle of, right. you know, I can't understand you, <laughs> you know, or whatever. I mean, it'll, it'll transfer out. Yeah. No, great. Uh, great point. Patrick Schaefer asked the question, does the comments move when Amy reschedules an appointment? When a patient yes. chooses to cancel an appointment, is there a message generated or dashboard that shows patients that canceled each day? Need to make sure contact patients in case it's an important visit they canceled. So that's uh, 
that's a very fair point. And you know, what we have seen is uh, that you're able to generate a report out of all scripts VM that shows all the patients that have canceled during the day. And that is, um, that is uh, that's the way that you could go back and follow through. I mean, ideally all of them should have had um, sub-level fault too. I know we work with um, you know, clinics who deal with, um, with patients who are high risk who need to have, um, who need to maintain their follow-ups. And uh, that's that's how they're doing it. Did I miss anything, Monica? The comments go. Um, so everything, when you go into PM, you select your location, you select the provider, you select your appointment type. And then he's talking about there's a comment field where you can put specifics, you know, about that person like, um, you know, patient, well, we got all kinds of stuff in hours. Patients here for this, or like we have patients that are here for what we call compliance visits. So we put their percentage there. Anything that comment field transfers over. Basically, it takes everything that's already attached to that appointment and it moves it to the next one. Right. That it gives. That's uh, that's great. Another question is when using roll call, is Amy able to identify and reschedule a specific type of appointment? For example, a physical. And so this, this has to um, do with the way the appointment is set up um, in the PM system, right? So, I mean, roll call will um, take a, a, an appointment and do a like-for-like -like reschedule. So, so it'll reschedule into the same type of appointment slot that the original appointment was scheduled for. Um, yeah, and then just to add to that, you know, it doesn't matter how many appointments uh, a practice has. You know, a practice can have, you know, 80 or 100 or more appointment types. Uh, it doesn't matter to Amy. That Amy will go out and just look for that specific appointment type. Right, right. Uh, yep. And uh, people wanted to get my uh, email. I'll send it over over the Q and A. Um, and if you have any other, um, if you have any other questions, I'm going to put in my um, email here. There you go. You have that. Um, so, so please, uh, please reach out if you have any questions and also if there's other topics that you'd like to see us discuss, uh, please go ahead and let us know as well. So thank you to our panelists uh, for the time and for everyone who attended. Um, looks like we had a very healthy participation. Good to see webinars are still running strong. So on that note, we'll sign off. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thanks.